Good morning, and welcome to Mountain View United Church's online worship service for Sunday, August 23rd, the 12th Sunday in Pentecost. We're back from vacation and ready to worship with you again. I pray that we'll feel God's Holy Spirit moving in us and among us as we worship together yet apart. And I pray that any new worshipers with us will feel comfortable and will feel that Holy Spirit as we worship. Please join me in our call to worship. God called the people of Israel to be ready to leave slavery in Egypt. Are you ready for God to lead you into new life? Yes, we are ready. St. Paul reminds us of Jesus' call to love our neighbors as ourselves. Are you ready to love one another? Yes, we are ready. Jesus calls us to work out our differences and find ways to get along. Are you ready to work together to proclaim the gospel? Yes, we are ready. The Psalms call us to sing a new song to God. Are you ready to sing praises to God? Yes, we are ready. Let us come together in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come this day to present our minds and bodies to you as a holy and living sacrifice. We seek the blessings that come from the renewal of our minds. 
May we discern your will and come to know what is good and acceptable and perfect in your sight. Amen. The Faithful Hall of Fame, Moses. This is Moses. Hello. Moses was a descendant of Joseph's brother Levi. Hey. Joseph and his brothers had many children and grandchildren who lived happily in Egypt. Eventually, a new pharaoh came to power who knew nothing of Joseph or what he had done. This pharaoh feared the Israelites because there was a great number of them living in Egypt, so he wanted to put a stop to their prosperity. Pharaoh made the Israelites slaves. He made them work long, hard hours building up Egyptian cities. But his plan didn't work, and the Israelites grew more in number and in strength. Eek. So Pharaoh made a rule that no Israelite boy would be allowed to live in Egypt. This is where Moses' story begins. You see, when Moses was born, his mother saw that he was a special baby. Hmm. And she kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer keep him a secret, she made a basket and put him in the Nile River among the reeds. Moses' sister stayed to watch what would happen to her baby brother. And soon the Pharaoh's daughter came to the edge of the river. When she saw the basket, hey. she sent her servant to get it. When she saw the baby, she felt sorry for him, uh -huh. thinking he must be an Israelite baby who wasn't supposed to live. Then Moses' sister asked the princess if she would like her to find an Israelite woman to take care of the baby. Uh -huh. So Moses' sister went and got her mother. Moses' own mother took care of him until he was old enough to live in the Pharaoh's house, where the princess adopted him as her son. And so Moses, an Israelite boy who wasn't supposed to live, became the adopted grandson of the Pharaoh and lived in the palace as God prepared him for a great destiny that was only just starting to unfold. My soul long 
to dwell in the tents of wakeness for a day in thy court is better than a thousand how Let us come together in our prayer of confession as we confess those things which weigh heavy on our hearts. Let us pray. O oh God, we too often live our Christian lives in the shadows. Called to be salt and light, we have been tasteless and dim. Called to profess our faith publicly, we have been hidden and silent imperceptible to those around us. Called to champion the voiceless, we have chosen comfort over controversy. Choosing to take the path of least offense, we have unwittingly offended you and have cheapened our faith in the eyes of our neighbors. For the many ways we have lived in the shadows, forgive us, O oh God. Grant us courage that we might shine like lights in this challenging world. Amen. Hear the good news. God loves us and delivers us from trouble, even trouble of our own making. God who hears our prayers forgives us and gives us the ability to renew our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Hebrew scripture is taken from the book of Exodus, starting at chapter 1, verse 8. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they came to dread the Israelites, the Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites, 
and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Amen. Our New Testament reading comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one, another, one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, 
the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Amen. Our Gospel reading comes from Matthew's Gospel in chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In 1927, Nellie McClung, Henrietta Muir Edwards, Emily Murphy, Louise McKinney, and Irene Parlby launched the Persons Case, contending that women could be qualified persons eligible to sit in the Senate. The women became known as the Famous Five. The Supreme Court of Canada ruled that current law did not recognize women as such. However, the case was won on appeal to the Judicial Committee of the British Privy Council, the court of last resort for Canada at the time. It was a landmark case in Can Canadian history. Until this case, women were not considered persons under f federal law. The law that prevailed prior to this case was an 1876 British common law ruling that stated that women were eligible for pain and penalties, but not rights and privileges. The ruling had important ramifications for women's rights as well as the legal approach to the Canadian Constitution. By the way, Nellie McClung also advocated for the ordination of women in the Methodist Church and later in 1934 in the United Church of Canada. She must have been successful for the first woman, Lydia Grushi, was ordained in 1936. Why this history lesson this morning? Well, the famous five changed the course of history in Canada. In our Hebrew scripture this morning, we encounter five females who stood up to the ruling Pharaoh and his edicts and changed the course of history for the Israelites. Our scripture is set in Egypt, verses 6 and 7, the verses just before our reading begins say, Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and that whole generation. But the Israelites were fruitful and prolific. 
multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. And our story begins. A new pharaoh ruled Egypt. He did not know the history of Joseph and the Israelites, nor did he care. All he saw was a group of non-Egyptians growing in numbers and strength. War and invasion by armies were common back then. And Pharaoh begins to think, what if there's a war or an invasion? What if the Israelites join forces with the invaders? And what if they fight against us? So the Egyptians had taskmasters over the Israelites and forced them into hard labor. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. And as there became more and more Israelites, the Egyptians made the forced labor harsher and harsher. Finally, Pharaoh came up with a plan. He called in two Hebrew midwives named Shifra and Pua. Now you know that if women are named in the Bible, it must be for some important reason. The two midwives come before Pharaoh and he lays down the law to them. When they attend to the births of Hebrew babies, they are to kill the boys, but let the girls live. It's the first case of ethnic cleansing reported in the Bible. Now Shifra and Pua have a problem. They know that God is all about life. They know the story of Joseph and how God saved Jacob's entire family from the long famine by bringing them to Egypt. They know how powerful God is. We are told that they feared God, they respected God, and they were in awe of God. They knew in their hearts that this infanticide, this genocide of Pharaoh's was wrong. Besides, their work was all about bringing new life into the world, not taking life. So they blatantly disobey Pharaoh's edict and continue to do their jobs. Before long, they're summoned once again by Pharaoh. Terry Peterson writes, My favorite part of this, this story is the midwife's answer to Pharaoh's question. Why have you done this when I told you to kill them? Shifram Pua faced with earthly power, don't apologize, don't plead for their lives, or appeal to religion or politics. They look Pharaoh in the eye and they do the last thing we expect of nice proper ladies. They lie. They tell their made up story convincingly enough that they leave the palace free women able to continue their lives and their important work. But Pharaoh isn't satisfied. He orders all the Egyptians to kill any baby boys born to Hebrews. He fostered the fear and hatred and dread that he created in Egypt. Marcy Old Glass believes that Pharaoh was targeting the wrong gender. The men aren't much trouble. They're br brutally abused slaves who build things for Pharaoh. It's the women who cause all the trouble. So our story moves along. Shifra and Pua have saved many lives with the rebellious act. But now the death threat hangs over every Hebrew baby boy. Egyptian citizens had been ordered to throw the babies into the Nile, where they will surely, surely die. It's a particularly cruel form of genocide. Meanwhile, a Levite couple had a son, a beautiful son. He was such a beautiful baby that his mother hid him for three months. 
If they were caught, not only will their son be thrown into the crocodile-infested waters, but his parents will likely face severe punishment as well. The unnamed mother comes up with a plan. Perhaps she trusts that God has a plan for her beautiful son. Perhaps she is so desperate with love for this child that setting him adrift on the Nile seems like a good idea. By putting him in the Nile, she is technically adhering to Pharaoh's law, even if he is in a water-resistant basket. The Hebrew word, word used here for basket is teva, which actually means ark. The word is only used here in reference to the basket and in Genesis in reference to Noah's ark. Of these arcs saved a chosen individual of God from the destructive force of water. It was a gutsy move by this desperate mother. The baby sister kept watch over the basket to see what would happen to him. At that time, Pharaoh's daughter, also unnamed, came down to the river to bathe. She spied the basket and sent her maid to get it for her. She probably heard the infant crying before she even opened the basket. When she saw the baby wailing in the basket, she took pity on him, even though he was obviously a Hebrew baby. The baby sister hovering around bravely steps forward and dares to speak to Pharaoh's daughter. Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter doesn't even hesitate and says yes. She disobeys her father's own edict by choosing to save the child rather than leaving him to a certain death in the Nile River. The baby sister brings back her mother, and she and Pharaoh's daughter set up an employment contract whereby Pharaoh's daughter pays the baby's actual mother to nurse her own baby. Then when he is weaned, she returns him to Pharaoh's daughter, who in essence adopts him, naming him Moses. And so begins the life of a, the great leader of Israel. Yet if not for the actions of those five brave females, Moses might never have survived his infancy or childhood. They indeed changed the future of the Hebrew people. Margaret Mead, a world-renowned anthropologist, is quoted as saying, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. While the five females in our scripture today weren't necessarily working together, their actions saved Moses. Shifra's and Pua's disobedience made it possible for Moses to survive his birth. His mother's disobedience in keeping him hidden for three months and her setting him adrift in the Nile kept him alive long enough for Pharaoh's daughter to find him. Moses' sister watched the basket as it moved downstream and then had the guts to speak to Pharaoh's daughter, thus ensuring that her mother was able to nurse Moses keeping him safe and ensuring his survival. And Pharaoh's daughter willingly disobeyed her father's law so she could ra raise Moses as her own son, thereby also ensuring not only his survival, but a quality education in all things. The United Church of Canada has long been associated with social justice, even before the days of the Depression. 
In the past, it was common for the moderator to meet with prime ministers and other politicians to discuss social justice issues in the country. The church has fought for human rights both in our own country and around the world. It also advocates justice for the planet amid environmental concerns. Jesus himself was a proponent of social justice, advocating for people of all kinds living on the margins of society. This advocacy work is at the core of our responsibility as Christians to follow the way of Jesus. Shifra and Pua, Moses' birth mother, later named as Jochebed, his sister Miriam, Miriam and Pharaoh's daughter all did what was right and rebelled against what was wrong. History is filled with people like these four women and one girl. Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Malala Yousafzai, Nellie McClung, Tommy Douglas, and many more people that we don't even know about. Not all were Christians, but they all advocated strongly for what was right. Now more than ever, we need to stand up for what is right. We need only to look to our neighbors to the south to see the erosion of civil rights, the right to affordable universal health care, women's rights, African-American rights, Mexican-American rights, LBGTQ plus rights, the plight of refugees all over the world, the rights of indigenous peoples here in Canada. Despite what one leaders would have us believe, all human beings are created in the image of God. No one group is better than another. God loves us all equally. There is no favorite. God is on the side of human beings. Sometimes it only takes a small action to effect change. Heaven knows our world needs change. Don't just go with the flow. Be the change that is needed in the world. Amen.
I know I repeat myself every Sunday, but I do still want to thank you all. Those who've checked in with other people in church who may need it. Those who have supported the church financially. Those who check out the church and make sure everything is going okay. That there is no damage done. And I do, I know I speak for the entire church when I say it is greatly, greatly appreciated. Let us pray. Loving God, accept our gifts in your holy name. Accept our very lives as a pledge to pursue what is good and acceptable and perfect in your sight. May our gifts become for the world resources to draw the endangered from the waters of death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In prayer, we bring everything to God, good things and bad things, and God always hears us when we pray. Let us come before God in prayer now. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we remember the people we know who are in trouble and pray for healing and happiness for all. We seek God's encouragement for honest trade and just commerce, for medicine and education, for the gifts and aptitudes in every person which serve justice in community living. We pray for peace on earth, for the generous sharing of the earth's resources, and the responsible sharing of the earth's problems for understanding of others 
and willingness to regard the diversity of human culture as more stimulating than threatening for the turning of swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. We pray for the church by all its names and in all its places, for its continuing usefulness as a channel of grace and hope, for its rescue from bureaucracy and stagnation, for its witness to unity and justice, for its commitment to hospitality and compassion. We commend to the Lord our families and friends, and let us ask God for to help us in the days of this coming week. Hear our prayers, O God, for we bring them in the strong name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever Amen.
As we leave this virtual worship space, go with the courage of the midwives, go with the love of Moses' mother, go with the boldness of Miriam, Moses' sister, go with the call of God in your hearts, a call as big and as powerful as the call of Moses. We go in love, for we are the people of God. Amen.